Hello everyone, my name is Pixelriffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. I'm having a great one because at the time of this recording, Minecraft 1.19, the wild update, is due out in a couple of days. And if you're watching this on the day it's released, it's coming out tomorrow. Now, I don't plan on making a video tomorrow that's like in the wild update because I don't know what time it's going to release and I'm not certain that I'm going to be able to have time to record and edit and publish a video all in the same day the wild update releases. So instead, we're going to take a look at trimming down the areas of the world that are not really in use right now, the areas where we haven't gone and built anything, the areas that we've spent a very limited amount of time, but we have loaded terrain because, of course, those terrain loaded areas, the areas where we've actually explored in the world, are not going to have any potential for generating new stuff because Mojang doesn't want to overwrite anything that the player has done in the world already and therefore we're not going to find the deep dark biome or a mangrove swamp generating in those areas. So that's what we're going to do for tomorrow's video. Today I'm kind of in a holding pattern right now. I don't really have a great deal of projects that I want to do before the wild update arrives. So what I was thinking of doing was taking off some of the advancements that we have haven't had a chance to get done on this list, or the ones that we've done like the advancements on either side, but haven't done the ones in the middle. For example, looking at a ghast through a spyglass. Seems like a very simple thing to do, there are plenty of ghasts floating around in the nether, I just haven't had a spyglass on me and the opportunity to look at a ghast. I would have done it like off camera or something probably, so it's the kind of thing that I've been saving for a video like this one. We can also try a couple of the challenge advancements like sniper duel where we have to kill a skeleton from at least 50 meters away and there are some that we are within a hair of completing already, like Monsters Hunted, which requires us to kill one of every hostile monster. There is only one monster left on that list, and before I go any further, I want you to go down to the comments section and guess which monster you think it is, because I've killed a lot of stuff in this series so far, but we're going to reveal the final monster in just a few seconds time. I can actually go into my statistics and track this down, which is a really good way of seeing which monsters you have and haven't killed in your own worlds if something is missing from this mobs list here right here then you have pretty much guaranteed that you haven't killed one of those or you haven't been killed by it I suppose and it's very unlikely that I would be killed by this one because if we look down through this list it's in alphabetical order which is pretty handy there is one mob missing. We killed a Zoglin in episode 101, so that was one of the two that I had remaining at that point. But you'll notice here there is a gap for Endermites between Enderman and Evoker. I have not killed an Endermite because the only time we've really seen an Endermite in this series has been when I trapped one in order to make the Enderman farm out in the end. So we're going to spam enderpearls for a little while. In order to get an endermite, we're going to kill it, and we're going to claim an advancement for killing every type of monster in the game. It's that simple. Now thankfully I do have plenty of enderpearls available to me, so we're going to take two stacks, because I think an endermite only pops up every, like, 16 or so. It's not a huge chance for endermites to spawn, but I don't know, sometimes we get lucky with these things. We'll have to make sure I eat occasionally here, because it's going to drain my health to spam enderpearls like this, but sooner or later we should find an endermite spawns, and we just need to make sure that our enderpearls land somewhere nearby, so that we can turn around and kill the endermite nice and quickly, once one eventually spawns in. Now that is one full stack of enderpearls, and now you can see how lucky I was when I got an endermite first try or second try or whatever it was when we set up the enderman farm. Yep, that's 20 enderpearls so far, and still no endermite. <laughs> and it's at times like this that you start to question whether the rules of the game you've been taught are correct, but now we have an endermite, and now we have completed that challenge. Monsters hunted for all monsters in the game killed. Very, very cool. That is 34 different types of monster. And the cool thing about this is, in the next update, when the Warden is added, it's not actually meant to be a monster that you kill. It is possible to kill it, but incredibly difficult, and the idea is that you're supposed to avoid it, for the most part, so it's not going to count towards monsters hunted in the advancements, and you're not going to need to kill the Warden to get that advancement, which I'm sure is going to be a relief to a great deal of people. <laughs> there is another advancement on this list that we are very, very close to completing, and it's all the way down 
down here, adventuring time. Once again, we are one biome away from having discovered every single biome in the game, and once again, I'm pretty confident I know which biome this is. A bunch of the biomes in this world are relatively far out. Obviously, we had to travel quite a distance to get to any deserts or badlands, any significant sized deserts or badlands anyway, and the snow plains is another area that I haven't really explored a great deal of because it's about four or five thousand blocks out in the world. However, the snow plains is where we're going to travel next because I'm fairly confident that the next biome I need to visit, the last biome I need to visit to get the Adventuring Time achievement, is going to be an ice spikes biome. So making sure I've got a boat on me, we're going to head through to the nether, take the boat path out to the snowy biomes in the world, and from there we should hopefully be able to track down an ice spikes. So here we are back in the frozen area of the world, and don't get it twisted, these are not ice spikes, these are of course part of the frozen ocean biome, and so those are just the typical icebergs that spawn as part of the ocean. For an ice spikes biome, we are going to have to go further afield, they are some of the rarer biomes in the snow plains tundra area, but you'll probably run into one or two of them if you have a large enough area like this one. So we're going to fly around a little bit, maybe travel a bit by boat because I always enjoy the ice boat travel, and we are going to see if we can track down an ice spikes biome in our world. There is also a massive grove biome here flanked by mountains, and while it's not an advancement in the traditional sense, it's not an advancement that's part of Minecraft's vanilla set of advancements, I'm going to make it a personal goal at some point to find some deep slate emerald ore, because that's the type of emerald ore that is probably the rarest ore in the game, and I'm honestly quite keen on tracking some down, because I really like emerald ore. It is pretty difficult to find though, because it will only generate around the levels of the world where deep slate generates, and at that point emerald ore distribution is relatively thin on the ground, so I'm expecting us to have a pretty tricky time finding that, but that seems like a decent stretch of mountains to go looking for it and maybe we'll get lucky and find some in the caves. But judging by the speed at which the world is loading in, this is new terrain, so we have never been here before and at last we have come across an ice spikes biome. And these are some pretty majestic looking biomes. Depending on the terrain especially, they can form in really interesting structures and these massive spires of ice surrounded by all of the smaller icebergs around there really look quite interesting and dramatic. They've got a kind of Empire State Building vibe to them. But all we should need to do is stroll into this biome and at that point we will get ourselves the Adventuring Time Advancement as long as we've never been here before. And there it is! Awesome stuff! We've got Adventuring Time in 1.18, and of course, in order to get that in 1.19, we just need to top it up, basically. All we will need to do is find a mangrove swamp biome and a deep dark biome, and hopefully at that point, we should be able to claim Adventuring Time once again. But this is a relatively small ice spikes biome, I've seen them go on for miles, like to the render distance and beyond in the past, but if you wanted to farm a bit more packed ice and you didn't really feel like wading out to the frozen oceans and dealing with icebergs, this is also a really good place to do that. For now though, we're gonna leave it be and it'll probably end up getting deleted when we delete the chunks of the world in tomorrow's video, although it'll probably generate the same whenever we want to come back here. Well now we've ticked that one off the bucket list and we've made our way back to the nether portal, let's see what's next on our list of advancements. I'm not planning on getting all of them today because there are some that I really want to dedicate an entire video to, like for example throwing a trident at something, because that also goes hand in hand with striking a villager with lightning, which we've done in the past but using a lightning rod instead of a channeling trident, and I think being able to control lightning using channeling is probably worth a whole episode on its own. Likewise, stuff like Star Trader, which requires you to trade with a villager at the build height limit, I think in future we want to make a trading hall on top of a mountain or something big like that, so I'm kind of saving that for a future project, maybe we can get some other types of villagers involved and we can make a whole thing out of it instead instead of just building a water column all the way to build height and trading with a villager up there. Like, it could happen that way, but I kind of want to make it more of a, a showpiece, kind of like the Guardian farm. That also does seem like an ideal time to do the Caves and Cliffs advancement for free-falling from the top of the build limit to the bottom of the world and surviving. We might do that in a separate video because that's a whole elaborate setup. But nearby, we have the advancement for playing a music disc in a jukebox in a meadow biome. And since we've just ticked off the Adventuring Time advancement just above that, 
why don't we track down a meadow biome and play some of our favorite tunes? I should still have the music discs in this shulker box right here, and hopefully I've left a jukebox in there. Perfect. I still don't have a copy of the other side music disc yet, and we are also waiting on another music disc to arrive with the 1.19 update, although that one's going to be a little bit trickier to get hold of. So for now, I think we'll just take our record collection out to the meadow, and I reckon we'll probably load up Pigstep. Here's a likely looking meadow down the river valley from our Riverlands area, and this seems like a perfect place to hang out and have a music festival. But maybe I shouldn't be the only person enjoying this music. I feel like somebody else can come along and appreciate this music with me. So <laughs> I'm just going to return to spawn real quick. We're going to grab our pet parrot from the roof of the starter house. And while this might be a kind of time consuming process, we're going to fly our way over to that meadow biome, pausing every so often so that the parrot can teleport to us because he can't stand on my shoulder while I'm flying out this way. Luckily, as long as he's within the loaded chunks and maybe even the simulation distance, I'm not quite sure how that works, the parrot should basically teleport to us every time we land. As long as we land on a solid block anyway, I don't think it works if you land on leaves. But if I alight in this meadow, there he is. He just teleported straight to me. So we can hop him on the shoulder right now and we should be able to run over to where I left the jukebox. And of course, to complete the music festival atmosphere, it's raining. Well, <laughs> me and my parrot can enjoy some tunes in the rain. I'm going to hop up onto here and then jump down so the parrot drops off my shoulder. And once we load up this music disc, the parrot will dance along to it. And there we go. We got the advancement, the sound of music. Very nice. Well, that was fun, even though it was raining. <laughs> still a pretty good time. And the parrot is still boogieing away here. But with the music disc ejected and the parrot back on my shoulder, I think it's time to return to spawn and take a look at our advancements list again. Next up, I can kill two birds with one stone, and I'm actually not going to get the two birds with one arrow advancement because that one is probably a little tricky, but we'll, we'll get to that in future. I think for now, though, we do need to get shooting a crossbow, and I think we can probably give a pillager a taste of their own medicine at the same time. I don't tend to use crossbows a whole lot in Minecraft because they have a fixed amount of damage they can deal. Obviously that varies depending on the types of arrows you're using because you can use harming arrows, various tipped arrows and even firework rockets to deal damage using a crossbow but frankly I find the bow a little bit more versatile, it has access to infinity and it deals a little bit more damage. So I don't tend to mess with crossbows all that much. Having said that we may as well craft a crossbow so we can cover that in the guide and I can show you a little more about how it works. Chances are you've probably even got a couple of crossbows lying around if you've done any pillager raids or, you know, attacked any pillagers at any point. They tend to drop them quite frequently. So I have a couple of crossbows around here, but I've still, according to my advancements at least, never actually fired one. In order to craft your own crossbow though, you need a couple of additional materials. First of all, we'll need to make a tripwire hook, something that we've covered in the redstone episodes and is also used for making trapped chests, but tripwire hooks are part of the recipe for crafting a crossbow as well. Similar to the recipe for a bow, you will also need a few sticks and a couple of string, but the idea here is that we're going to put an iron ingot and a tripwire hook in the recipe as well, and that's going to come out as a crossbow. Now one advantage crossbows have over bows is that you can load them but not fire them. If we hold down right click, you can load up a crossbow in front of you and it'll fire instantly when you right click. And now is the time we need to go find a pillager. And if you think I'm going to be attacking my upside down pillager for this, you're absolutely out of your mind. We're not going to do that. <laughs> Instead, we're going to isolate one of these guys, we're going to give him a quick crit with the netherite sword and that should have dealt enough damage that we can one shot him. Oh, it didn't happen for us unfortunately. Never mind. Well, we can always load up and have another go and at least we got the old Betsy advancement. Yeah, for some reason these guys are tougher than I expected them to be, which is kind of funny. We can probably give him a couple of quick taps with the crossbow. Maybe we can fire another arrow in here as well. And once we take him out, there we go. We get the who's the pillager now advancement. I was really hoping we'd get both of those at once, but hey, never mind. I miscalculated a little bit. The real advantages of crossbows though come when you start to take into account enchanting because crossbows have a variety of unique enchantments that we can put on them that aren't really part of the bow's enchantment set. Let's see if we get lucky and get a couple of those. I saw unbreaking three come up in the table but I'm hoping that we get a couple more 
just on breaking three, of course. Standard survival guide luck at this point. <laughs> but since I have 40 levels, we might as well re-roll the table and see if we get something else. And there we go. We got piercing four and quick charge two. Now, quick charge kind of does what it says on the tin, really. If you load up the crossbow another time, you'll find that it loads faster than a standard crossbow does. Quick charge has three different levels, as you might expect. So once you have quick charge three, you'll be reloading your crossbow a lot faster. The piercing enchantment allows you to hit multiple targets. So as long as they're like lined up like that, you can see that I managed to hit three pillagers all at once, thanks to the fact that my crossbow now has piercing four. This can be really useful for crowd control, and that's also another place where the crossbow has an advantage over the bow, because another enchantment you can get on crossbows, you cannot get it on bows at all, is an enchantment called multi-shot, which fires a spread of three arrows for every one arrow you fire, and it only consumes one arrow at a time from your inventory. Once again though, our arrow supply is dwindling, thanks to the fact that crossbows cannot have infinity, so I'm probably not going to spend too much time with a crossbow here in this episode, but piercing is the key to getting two birds one arrow, and also a secret advancement called Arbalistic, where you have to fire a piercing arrow through several mobs and kill them all using the same shot. Once again, we'll cover that in its own episode because it's a secret advancement and I think it deserves to be done properly. While we're on a roll though, this pillager dropped crossbow might be able to be enchanted with multi-shot, so let's give this enchanting table a couple more attempts. There we go, multi-shot is coming up, and multi-shot and piercing are mutually exclusive. You can't put them both on the same crossbow, otherwise that would be even more powerful, since it would allow you to hit something like 12 or 15 targets if you lined them up correctly. That seems like a cool idea, but unfortunately not the case. And I'm going to leave that in this chest here for now, so that we can add a couple of enchantments to it in future. I might want to put mending on it so we can repair the durability, and it can still have quick charge, so with quick charge and multi-shot, plus a handful of harming arrows, you can be pretty dead. Now on Java Edition, there is actually a limit to how many arrows can damage something at once. Basically, when something gets hit by one arrow, it's granted a brief period of invulnerability, so the other arrows that might have hit it pass through it harmlessly. Hey, the pillager patrol down here might actually be a good chance to demonstrate the multi-shot capabilities of this crossbow, seeing as there's a, a whole crowd of them down here right now. But as I was saying, on Java Edition, it's not possible to just stand right up close to something and multi-shot all three arrows into it. However, on Bedrock Edition, that is not the case, and so a multi-shot crossbow loaded up with arrows of harming can actually be a pretty deadly weapon. And depending on whether I can craft the supplies in here, we might be able to show off the firework launching capabilities of a crossbow. It looks like I've got some gunpowder and some paper. In order to utilize a rocket's more explosive potential, we need to craft a firework star. So we're going to craft that together with some gunpowder and some dye, like so. And now, unfortunately, we'll need some gunpowder in order to craft it, so I might need to sneak out of here. There we go. Here are my extra supplies. And here's another cool fact for you, actually. If you want to craft a firework using a firework star, some gunpowder, and some paper, that'll get you the fireworks that have all of the different effects. But if you craft together a firework with multiple firework stars in there, it's going to deal more damage when fired using a crossbow. Now we're going to chuck the arrows out of here, and in fact, I'm going to hold these in my offhand to make sure I'm loading the right type of firework into my crossbow. We want to make sure that we don't end up loading our flight rockets in there, because those won't explode at all, so they'll be pretty harmless when it comes to dealing damage to these pillagers. But if the pillagers are still around here, we now have a much more explosive weapon in order to deal with them. And unfortunately, it looks like they may have despawned. I think I got too far away. <laughs> so never mind that, we'll head back to the pillager outpost and we'll see if there are a couple of pillagers down here on whom we can give this a try. Yep, looks like we have a whole bunch of them spawning out here on the plains now. Let's see if we can get a group together and take them all out with one firework shot. Here we go, multi-shot crossbow with some fireworks. Bang, there we go. That is our first multi-shot firework off. Let's see if we can get another one. And as you can see, it's doing a bit of damage to them, but it's not enough to take them out in one hit. Let's swap to the slightly more powerful fireworks and see what we can do here. Our blue fireworks should be a little bit more powerful. There we go. We've managed to take out the others and one last guy remains. Fantastic. Going off with a bang. And the coolest part about that is that the recipe for fireworks can load up seven fireworks stars in the remaining slots of your crafting interface, meaning that obviously with a little bit more expense, you can make rockets with a whole bunch of effects and obviously you're going to craft three of those at a time, but if we fire one of these at a pillager captain, it's going to go off with a huge explosion, and while it doesn't one-shot him, it still deals a fair amount of damage. There is potential to damage yourself with these, though, since it is effectively an explosion, kind of similar to TNT, so if we stand too close to the wall here, there you go, we set off that white firework, it dealt a heart of damage to me. Now watch what happens if I set off the yellow firework right in my own face. There we go, we took 
three and a half hearts of damage, and that's with full protection diamond and a bit of netherite armor. And now it's definitely time to put this multi-shot crossbow away because uh, it's looking a little rough in terms of durability. Luckily, I don't have any other villagers nearby, so nice and easy to get rid of this bad omen effect. And now we can return to our list of advancements. There are at least two more that I really want to do today. First of all, we need to look at a ghast through a spyglass. We talked about that one already, but this one here is one that people have been hounding me about in the comments for the last little while to get a full suit of netherite armor. And as we saw, I only have a diamond helmet and diamond leggings right now. I've got netherite on my boots, but frankly, I haven't really found the right occasion to go mining for more netherite. Today seems like the right day to do it. And of course, I've been farming a fair amount of gunpowder from my mob farm, so we have plenty of TNT ready to do the job. I always prefer to mine netherite using TNT rather than any other method. Even though beds are cheaper and using a pickaxe is cheaper still, I just like the convenience of using TNT. It's a nice clean method of doing it and relatively risk-free. So I'm looking forward to blasting my way through a little bit of netherrack and hopefully encountering enough debris that we can upgrade the last three pieces of my armor because yes we will have to do the chest plate as well. Let's load all of that into an empty shulker box and take it into the depths of the nether and on the way we should be able to find ourselves a ghast to look at. Okay task number one find a ghast. Nice and easy just got to head out to a soul sand valley and wait for a couple of seconds because there are usually ghasts around here and we can also start to scout for good locations for netherite mining. I tend to avoid going anywhere near Basel deltas when it comes to mining netherite because they're just a little bit awkward to mine through, they take a little bit longer and TNT is less effective there than it is on netherrack. Wait a second, wait a second, I think I hear a ghast, now it's just a matter of tracking it down in the uh, more cavernous environment that we've got here. It's certainly around here somewhere though, maybe it's actually below us, let's see if we can dive down and track down where this ghast is hanging out. Oh no, it looks like it despawned, man. <laughs> You've really got to catch these things quite quickly. Amazing how it feels like they can be everywhere sometimes, but when you actually want to find a ghast, they are nowhere. <laughs> At last! A ghast! There we got it! Is it a balloon? We've managed to complete the trilogy of spyglass advancements. That's very, very cool. And now, to celebrate, I think we're going to take out this ghast melee style. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. Even caught the drops in midair. Okay, let's sit down somewhere and let's start our new netherite mine. I think over here seems like a good place to start. We might be floating over the lava lake somewhat, but I did bring myself along with a bunch more TNT, a bunch of fire resistance potions. So at the very least, we'll be good if we encounter too much lava while we're mining. And if need be, we can mine on down through the lava lake level and come out on the other side. But if we pick the right spot, we can actually avoid most of that. And if we come out at about Y15 around here, yes, this is probably the perfect coordinates to start mining for netherite. So we're going to start with a little three wide staging area here, just so we know we have a place that we can start our tunnels from. And then we're going to dig into the netherrack as far as we can go basically until we reach a basalt delta or an impassable lava pocket which this one might be but usually we can find ways to fill in the blocks around it and get rid of the lava and if we dig along chunk borders that may increase our chances of finding veins of netherite from either one chunk or the other it'll also be a decent way of spacing our tunnels a certain amount of blocks apart i decided that this tunnel is unfortunately a bust because there's a massive lava pocket there and i don't feel like wasting a fire resistance potion on it but then when all the tunnels you want to make have lava pockets in them sometimes there's just no alternative so I'm gonna spend a bit of time wading through lava I might do a bunch of this on a live stream actually because I've always enjoyed streaming this stuff but when we're done being on fire and we come out the other side hopefully we should have a fair amount of netherite to show for it all right, I'm back from the nether, and I spent a lot of TNT on this. I still have a decent amount, though, thank goodness, because we're probably going to need it for some other projects here and there. Went through a bunch of fire resistance potions in total. I spent about three hours mining for netherite, and we now have... <laughs> A lot more ancient debris! This is the most ancient debris I've seen in quite a while. We got two stacks and 18, or let me see if my maths is correct, 144? I think that's about what we have here. So this is all going to get run through a blast furnace pretty quickly, and I think we need to upgrade our netherite gear, finally, to a full suit of netherite armor, which most of which we're going to use most of the time, but we're still probably going to be wearing an elytra most of the time instead of the chest plate. Still, nice to have the chest plate and nice to get the advancement. Also kind of nice to use this little blast furnace in my house every so often. I have auto smelters all over the place. We've got one over in the uh, storage building over there with regular furnaces. We've also got one in the dripstone cave base, but I don't know. I kind of like coming back to my little house every so often. So what are we going to do with all the other ancient 
station debris because frankly we don't need this much we only needed 12 and we got that before i even started the stream so well i think we're still going to turn a decent amount of it into netherite ingots because of course those can be used to upgrade materials in future in case we lose some of our tools or armor or something like that i think it's a great idea to have backups for all of this but the rest of it I think we might maybe turn into netherite blocks since this will be the first opportunity we've already had to hold a netherite block in our hands in this series and they don't really come around very often. I might also keep some ancient debris for building with because I don't know I really like the texture of it it's always had this really interesting like junkyard texture of like a bunch of scrap metal that's all been balled up together and I like that I think it's kind of a cool texture and maybe we'll end up using it at some point in future honestly it could look really good in projects like the dripstone cave which is meant to have a more kind of industrial more metallic kind of feel to it but I honestly don't know if we'd see it all that much once we're done with the dripstone cave base so I still feel like it should go somewhere a bit more prominent than that anyway I think I'm going to keep maybe half a stack of this as raw ancient debris but the rest of it is all going to get smelted up and right now yeah we have enough netherite scrap to last a little while so let me quickly check that i've at least got enough gold for this of course i have we've got plenty of gold i've been getting gold while we've been mining for for the netherite as well let's see we've got six netherite ingots that's looking pretty good so far and while we're not going to use all of this we are going to use five of it first of all to upgrade the helmet the leggings and the chest plate oh yes there it is! We got ourselves a full suit of netherite armor. Let's try this on for size. It looks pretty glowy and purple. To be honest, I've never quite liked the way Enchantment Glow looks on a full suit of netherite armor. It always looks a little overwhelming and doesn't really let the actual texture shine through. But of course, the point is that it has all of the enchantments on it, and we know that it's got all of the enchantments on it. So the netherite chest plate is probably going to go back in the backup gear box because I don't tend to use that all that much. But we're also going to upgrade my Silk Touch hoe to netherite. There we go. And I've also got these Frost Walker 2 boots, which I decided we would probably give the netherite upgrade to as well. Well, in case we need to swap those out every so often so we got hold of those as well it's nice to have a matching pair of netherite hose now remind me to go and mend those one of these days in the meantime our blast furnace is done smelting even more of the netherite scrap we can put the remaining ancient debris in there and i think we might now have enough give or take plus a little bit extra in the way of gold to have <laughs> 10 netherite ingots in hand which we can turn into a single block of netherite and yes the first time we've held a netherite block in this series bam look at that i always love the texture of netherite blocks i think they look fantastic they are the slowest block to mine in all of the resource blocks though and yes you can make any tier or the entire beacon base out of netherite blocks but my goodness they're a grind to get hold of imagine what we did today imagine getting 144 ancient debris taking me about three hours and now imagine getting 5904 i've done it in the past i know the exact number yeah we've done the netherite beacon thing before i don't think we'll be doing it again but i kind of want to keep some blocks of netherite around in order to build with them and to break down into netherite ingots on the off chance that we need to upgrade any of our tools and armor in future i feel like we probably need to add a little netherite barrel to our resource chests here so let's move the shulker box out of the way this one i think just has ores and stuff in it yeah it's got a bunch of copper and iron ore that wasn't going to fit into the storage system let's see if we can throw another barrel down there next to the diamonds and that's going to have the block of netherite sat there right above it we need some other kind of material to go there i don't know if there's any more precious materials that really fit the bill but either way we'll put the rest of the ancient debris in there we'll probably turn the rest of the netherite scrap there into netherite i'll grab a bit more gold we'll do the rest of that between episodes but i'm thinking we can probably squeeze one more advancement in we've got a few others to choose from a couple of fairly straightforward ones but i think i know which one we're going to go for and this one's pretty much straightforward all i need to do is get up here remove my elytra and not miss the ground there we go <laughs> post mortal getting ourselves that totem of undying and that's one totem popped but of course we will end up using a few more in future for some fun bits and pieces in the meantime we can take a look at the fact that it gave us regeneration 2 and fire resistance for a little while so thanks to that golden carrot my health is already back up to full it's it's a pretty powerful effect and they never used to give you fire resistance on java edition they did on bedrock but not on java so super cool and it will keep you safe from any deaths in lava if you happen to be waiting out there without fire resistance well folks all in all it's been a pretty advanced episode and i feel a lot better for having finally got the full set of netherite armor so hopefully folks will be happy about 
about that as well. That's where we're going to wrap things up for today. But tomorrow, as I mentioned, we are going to be looking at the process of trimming our world in preparation for the arrival of Minecraft 1.19, the wild update. So stick around for that if you're interested in the process of upgrading a world. And I hope you all look forward to the update arriving tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more. And I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now. Thank you.